you've just been told it's being recorded too. Uh, we do hope that we get lots of people able to watch this, the recording later, because doing it in the middle of the day, because Peter's in Mexico and it's 9 p.m. for him, um, was the was the time that worked. And so we'll be um, hoping that those who can't stop in the middle of the day for such an exciting conversation can catch it, catch it later. Um, I'd just like to first acknowledge that I'm joining you all from the unceded lands of the Jodjawurrung, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I'd invite all of you to note in the chat whose land you're joining us from so that we can all start to get better at understanding the original names of the, this country. Uh, you're joining the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance's solidarity session. I don't even know what number we're up to, but it's a lot. Uh, we started these sessions at the beginning of the pandemic as a way to continue to collectivize, organize and act, and as a way to keep lifting the, um, the voices and promoting the stories of people who are doing good work for the future that we all um, are, are hoping our children and their children and their children can have. So it's been so successful, I think, even as people are allowed to meet in person again, we'll, um, we'll keep doing these because we, it lets us join from across the country. Um, today's pretty exciting and special for me. So Peter Rossa is somebody I've admired from afar for a very long time. And then as happens in uh, movements across the world, we became friends on social media at some stage after I'd been reading his work for many more years. And, uh, and then I think I cheekily contacted him and said, hey, Peter, would you like to read my PhD research proposal <laughs> and have a chat with me about whether I'm on the right track? And um, since then I've listened and read more of Peter's work and continue to be inspired by how much he's done for food sovereignty and an agroecological transition globally. Um, he's going to start us off by sharing um, I guess a bit of the, the history and the evidence for an agroecological transition. And then we're gonna move into more conversation about what that might look like in Australia in particular, um, what the barriers might be uh, and what the opportunities are. And we'll do it as after the initial context setting, it will be a conversation that we will be inviting all of you to also participate in. So we'll start with some, some questions and discussion and then we'll say, anyone else kind of wanna, have we not answered something or, do you want to throw in your own thoughts about the context here, especially? So if I can hand it over to Peter now for a bit of an opening and, you know, why, why agroecology, Peter? Off you go. Okay, well, let me first start with a little bit about me. Uh, I have a, a, a kind of a double life. I've uh, been a member of the, of the Secretariat of La Via Campesina Interna Inter International, which is the global movement of family farmers, peasant farmers, indigenous people, farm workers, landless people, forest dwellers, uh, no, nomadic pastoralists, and, 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 other, and other groups of rural people, rural women, rural youth around the world, which I believe the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance is part of. And at the same time, I'm also a university professor and researcher here in Mexico. I'm talking to you from southeastern Mexico, the state of Chiapas, which is the, the Mayan cultural region of Chiapas, uh, of Mexico, and Chiapas is the home to the Zapatista uh, autonomous communities that started with the Zapatista armed uprising in 1994, and which uh, there are very many interesting things related to that and also related to our topic today. So both in my years in Via Campesina, I've recently retired from the, from the, from the secretariat, and also in, in the university world, my focus has been on agroecology, on social, rural social movements like Via Campesina, on food sovereignty, and on issues having to do with access to land, land reform, and defense of land and territory from, from land grabbers. Agroecology in particular is interesting because I would say that 25 years ago, most of the small farm family farmer, peasant organizations in Via Campesina around the world were thinking in terms of demanding uh, more credit to buy more chemical inputs like chemical fertilizer and pesticide and commercial seeds, tractors, et cetera, for small farmers. And that, that was the struggle at that time. 
But over time, a lot of harsh tr truths came to be uh, clear to the organizations, such as people who had been landless before and then struggled to acquire land, usually get low quality land. Maybe it's a eroded, degraded pasture land. Previously, fertilizer doesn't penetrate into the soil. Uh, all of that production model anyway requires a lot of money. And we're talking about smaller farmers, family farmers who can't compete with large scale agribusiness. If the basis of that competition is who has the most money to invest or the most access to, to bank credit on a liquid basis. So over time, most of the organizations changed over the say the last two decades. And now almost every organization in La Via Campesina around the world has some kind of a process to help their membership base become a transition to agroecological farming from the conventional monoculture model. And that has proven to be much more compatible with the reality that family farmers inhabit, both their financial reality, uh, the kind of land that they have access to, and also something that can give them a difference or, or an advantage in the market. And, and agroecology didn't really arise from Via Campesina, but it's been taken on by Via Campesina as a global social movement. And today, I would say that Via Campesina is recognized as one of the most important advocates as well as practitioners of, agri of agroecology around the world. Now, uh, as to whether agroecology is better than conventional monoculture or or intensive livestock production under confinement. There's a, there's a world of evidence that it's better in many different ways. First of all, more diverse systems like agroecological systems can produce much more per unit of, air, of area. They can also often produce more per unit of labor depending. That's a little bit less sure, but depends on, on the conditions or, or, the, or the reality in which farmers find themselves. Uh, agroecological farming has much can have much lower production costs and there's some key issues to deal with and I'm not sure where Australia fits in this in this continuum but when we look at third world countries and in, in the in the global south typically agroecological farmers stop buying all of those those expensive inputs and start using local synergisms between different plants and animals in the system to make up for not buying those inputs, but when we look at the equivalent in say Europe and the United States, typically people stick to the monoculture model and stick to the mentality of buying inputs from off the farm. And so they may be buying very expensive commercial compost or commercial uh, biological organic compatible preparations for controlling pests. And in fact, they may have higher production costs. So we have a big difference between countries in the south and countries in the north about whether agroecology has lower production costs. In the global south, it, it typically has drastically lower production costs. And in, in, in countries in the north, it typically has slightly higher production costs and it also slightly lower yields because they stick to a monoculture. Whereas in the global south, people do diverse systems and then get that, that productivity, that total productivity enhancement from having a diverse system. So the best of both worlds, lower costs and higher production is typically the case in countries like Mexico or India or South America or Thailand or, or African countries, as opposed to Europe and the United States where there's often a penalty paid, basically in my opinion, because they're doing it wrong, I guess would be the best way, best way to say it. Also in terms of climate change, Agroecology addresses most, and as well as localized food production through food sovereignty, addresses most of the reasons why our food system is one of the main emitters of greenhouse gases and drivers of climate change. It's also much more resilient to climate shocks uh, because it's more diverse. It's less likely to be wiped out by one temperature change or, or one kind of a storm or one kind of a drought. So uh, it's better uh, for uh, traditional livelihoods in rural areas. It's more compatible with the relationship between rural people and nature. It's more, more compatible with restoring natural environments or degraded environments. So there's a huge number of advantages and, and, and really it's hard to see from an from a, from a objective point of view why not everybody's doing it, but that's not getting then into all of the barriers and the way that the deck 
The cards are stacked in the deck against doing things differently. There's so much lock-in to the conventional system through credit, through machinery, through markets, through contracts, through uh, what's installed in our brains as, as received wisdom from the system, mindset. So even though it's got all these, these scientifically demonstrated benefits, it still hasn't, uh, been, we still haven't been able to, to break the encirclement by the dominant capitalist model and make agroecology into the, into the dominant model. So I think that's pretty much the background as to where we are. And as I said, most, most of the organizations in Via Campesina at least aspire to leading a, a, an agri, agroecological transition through their membership base. That's great. That's an excellent overview. Thanks, Peter. And, um, and AFSA certainly, as well as being a member of Via Campesina, we, um, as you say, aspire to helping with an agroecological transition in this country. Um, which poses, as you also said, certain uh, challenges in an export focused colonized country with mostly extremely large land holdings. And so, and then, and then as um, with a subset of people who are trying to get onto land and finding it increasingly difficult, which has only got worse actually with the pandemic. I don't know what it's like in, in North America, but I imagine it's similar here. The drain from the cities is, is um, pretty profound and the land prices have been going up you know, along with that. So I guess that brings to the first question that I thought we should discuss is before we go much further into some of those barriers and opportunities, what even is the relevance of agroecology in a country like Australia where, where we do have so much vast land holdings? Um, I know I had one farmer say to me that he did a bit of the Berkeley um, study on agroecology and which Peter has taught into um, and uh, he was he came away from it feeling that he was told that if he was on large acreage which he's only on about 200 acres to be fair um he if he was on large acreage he wasn't a peasant he couldn't do agroecology uh what would be i mean i have my own views but what would be your your thoughts in response to that because i think it's not an uncommon feeling like if this is about small holdings what what's the scale question how does it apply to what we're talking about with agroecology I mean, agroecology is pretty complex because there's the, the we you can take it you can take different cuts at it. One would be a narrow technical view, and and another would be a broader social, economic, political, cultural view, which would be the view that Via Campesina and most social movements or activists take. But from a a narrow, if we just look narrow at the narrowly at the technical, agronomic, biological, ecological aspects of of agroecology. Uh, it, what, what it's based on, and this is something that's often said, is based on principles, not on recipes. So that means it's you're not going to do the same thing everywhere. However, you will apply the different, the same principles, but in different ways depending on each local reality. So, for example, a principle could be diversification, or a principle could be protecting the soil, or a principle could be looking for ways to have a more closed system and a more open system. So in terms of those technical principles, there is really in principle no reason why they can't be applied in different scales or different sizes. And this is something that Miguel Altieri, the retired professor from Berkeley, and I have written about before, that in fact, on the narrow technical side, you can apply agroecological principles at, at, at wildly different scales. For example, if you want to plant a typical thing that peasants do, which is a, a polyculture or intercropping instead of a monoculture, people say, oh, but if I have 200 acres, I can't do that because, uh, because I use a tractor. And how, how, how are we going to interplant? But in fact, I myself have planted on a large scale by putting, by mounting, uh, for example, two tomato seed planters and then two bead seed planters on the outside and going along the raised beds and planting rows of beans around the, the, the internal rows of tomatoes, just as one example. There's a, a lot of different ways you can implement these principles at different scales. Also, Miguel has worked on having wild vegetation strips, also Clara, Clara Nichols, coming into large areas. For example, they work on large vineyards in California and in Chile. 
and very, very large, even corporate vineyards. And by having huge strips or corridors of wild vegetation, they're able to get natural enemies from the grape pests into the middle of the vineyards. And then they control the insect pests instead of the need for insecticide. So uh, on the technical side, yeah, you can, you can do it on a lot of different scales. And a lot of agribusiness now is trying to appropriate the technical part of agroecology because they're having sustainable sustainability problems as well. The thing is that agroecology, as most of us see it, is not just limited to the technical aspect. And we would like to see agroecology combined or as part of agroecology or a principle of agroecology, adding in things having to do with social justice, for example. And, and adding in a social justice component, then it gets difficult to say, look at a country like Brazil, where a tiny number of people have vastly large land owning, so, hard, so large that they can barely use them at all, where, and then there are millions of, of, of would-be small farmers who are, landless, who are landless and living in abject poverty because some people have all the land that, that's way more than they could ever use, and other people have no land at all. And so we like to put the, the, the sort of social political component, social justice component into it. I think that's really, that's really helpful. Um, and and I, I think we have an interesting conversation in this country really just beginning about regenerative agriculture and agroecology and the ways that they're similar or different. And for me, that first point that you made that the you know, the, the technical aspects of agroecology are essentially regenerative agriculture. And, and, it, and those who are affiliating with regenerative agriculture can move into the social and political aspects and call it whatever they want, but it has to have the social and political aspects to be what we know as agroecology as a movement. Um, I might actually just there ask if anyone has any questions or thoughts to contribute to that before I move on to the next question I have for you, Peter. Um, does anyone have, and you can also be putting questions in the chat as we go if you prefer, but if you'd like to put your hand up and ask one um, verbally, you're welcome to. It is meant to be, solidarity sessions are meant to be in the campesino a campesino kind of style where we actually do farmer to farmer talk about what people want to know or want to contribute. If not, I'll move next. Um, Colin Seiss is making the point that social equality is part of regenerative farming, Martin saying. That's right, Colin does. And I think he's been doing wonderful work to help regenerate rural communities, um, getting farmers working together rather than the old competitive mindset. Still have to tackle the political barriers to a lot of what we do too, though. Um, so Peter, on the obstacles. You've seen a lot of land tenure issues from the global south. I don't know how much you've seen of land tenure issues in the global north um, and whether you have some views on, we have a lot of young people, the food sovereignty movement, you know, is quite different to the um, industrial agriculture space where the age is rising, the average age of farmers is rising. In our movement, it's probably um, more under 40s are trying to get into farming than over. And that's really exciting for our movement, but the barrier is land access. So yeah, I would say in the, in the global in the global north, absolutely true, whether we're talking about Japan, Europe, the United States, um, and, uh, other countries, young people just don't have access to land. Land speculation in many cases has driven the cost of land way beyond any reasonable possibility or any way that you could pay for that land uh, and, and still make a profit farming off of it or make a living farming off of it. So uh, I would say that in general, the global north needs land reform, just like the global south needs yeah. land reform. And, you know, they're interesting. There's there are a lot of innovative ways to do that. There's land occupation movements, for example, in many European countries, they're the land trusts and in the United States, they're trying to, some countries try to encourage people through tax shelters to donate land. Um, governments can exercise eminent domain. They can, they can expropriate land to do land reform. They normally won't do that unless a very powerful social movement forces them to do it, typically by taking matters into their own, forcing the issue by doing land occupations. But yes, in answer to your question, 
the, 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 although we don't hear it spoken about as much, but the land issue is really just about as severe, especially if we talk about new farmers in the global north. Yeah. Um, Georgie's asked a question in here, actually, which we wanted to also center. It's in Australia right now. It's it's NADOC week, so we are celebrating and trying to um, prioritize and promote the, the needs of Indigenous sovereignty and Indigenous peoples. And she's asked a great question um, on your thoughts of trying to move towards agroecology for smallholders and Indigenous sovereignty at the same time, because these can obviously be seen as competing interests if we have non-Indigenous desires for land access, um, and that's still on unceded land. So do you have thoughts on Oh, that, that, those are kind of things that I, I haven't really been in the in the Australian situation, so I don't have a good a good grasp on it. But I, 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 I've seen one. Uh, I was talking to a Native American leader from the Canadian U.S. border recently in an air in an airport. This is just an anecdote, but she was saying that there was there was a tense relationship in 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 her region between white farmers and and Native Americans who were suffering land shortages, but then uh, a big mining concession came into the area and basically put under attack everybody and created a new, a, a new dynamic of solidarity, which included some of the, some of the white farmers voluntarily uh, coming to different kinds of agreements to give up part of their land so that Native Americans could farm on it as a result of facing a common enemy. So. You know, not, not, nothing is unchangeable, I guess, but I really don't know that much about, I guess I would ask you more about what can be done in a situation like Australia. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's actually a question that's central to the research I'm doing too, and um, trying to you know, sit with the discomfort of, of fighting for rights of non-Indigenous farmers at the same time that we're all, we're all farming on unceded lands. And there have been some farmers and Indigenous uh, folks making, working on relationships to share land. So a famous one for me is, is Murray Pryor at Nguru Farm in outside of Gundaroo, in, in outside of Canberra. Um, and he was recently on a webinar talking about that and his relationship with local mob and how he's opened up the land for use. There's also another one, Mill Post Farm is something doing similar. Um, and uh, actually Belvedere Farm, one of our committee members is doing work up there as well. So. But I'd like to hear some more of the indigenous led um, examples too, where it's not just about um, non-indigenous farmers making land available, but how are, how are other, how is other work being done? And I, I'm not sure yet. Yeah. I'm hoping well, I, mean, I, I see that somebody's mentioned this also in the chat that they'd be interested in hearing about, about other contexts and sort of like the history of, of, of uh, uh, on the technological side of Via Campesina moving from demanding conventional inputs for small farmers towards agroecology on the agrarian reform or land reform side, there's been a similar kind of evolution because as Via Campesina started as essentially um, a movement either of farmers or of would-be farmers, people who wanted land to be farmers, uh, it tended not to think about the perspective of, of indigenous people or uh, artisanal fisher folk, including those who fish on rivers and lakes, and to think about uh, people who, who are uh, forest dwelling peoples or other kinds of traditional peoples or uh, uh, nomadic past, uh, animal pastor, pastoralists. And so historically, when first agrarian reforms were carried out in many parts of the world, by giving one segment of people, i.e. those who either are or want to be sedentary farmers, access to land, the first thing those farmers would do is fence off their land and immediately cut off the access to traditional grazing sites by pastoralist peoples, to forest by forest people, access to river to river banks by river people, and created a lot of land conflicts amongst different segments of different poor populations who live in the same territory. And this kind of came to a head over, over the years because Via Campesina as a farmer movement was always calling for agrarian reform, but then indigenous peoples movements, the nomadic pastoralist movements and others were questioning that like, why are you putting the interests of one sector above the interests of others? 
and, uh, and sort of in the early 2000s, 2006, 2007, there were a series of very important forums and encounters where Via Campesina was meeting together with representatives of indigenous peoples movements, pastoralist movements, uh, artisanal fisher folk movements, and came to realize that the old concepts of agrarian reform, i.e. just land for farming, uh, didn't do justice to the complex reality and also the need for people's movements to to uh, to live to, to live with each other and build a common front against capitalist land grabbing mining expansion large-scale agribusiness and that are threatening the land of everybody for, for example in Brazil in the Amazon region it's a region where the territories are a, are a very complex patchwork or mosaic of, of indigenous people who are farmers, indigenous people who are forest dwellers, river fisher folk, me, uh, mestizo, non-indigenous farmers, uh, rural townsfolk, and, and there were a lot of conflicts historically between those different groups, but those are being overcome as we speak because it's the biggest area of mining expansion, like the, like, the, like the Canadian Native American woman said, and that's putting under attack the land of everybody. And it's kind of been a wake up call or a slap in the face, like, what are you guys doing fighting with each other? Or what are we doing fighting with each other when the mining company is coming to ruin the land of everybody, indigenous people, non-indigenous people, forest dwellers, farmers, fisher folk, pastoralists. And so it's created a whole kind of a conflict resolution and coming to joint positions, sharing land kind of a thing. And this is like the cutting edge of what's happening right now. And it's, it's with this huge, after all of the big financial bubble collapses, there's all this investment now going to rural areas and things like mining are expanding much more than they had in previous, more recent historical periods. Uh, different kinds of energy generation, land grabbing and other things that are pushing pushing people sectors, whether indigenous, not indigenous, to talk to each other and to come to agreements because of this facing a larger and more powerful external enemy context that we're facing in most parts of the world now. Mm. So do you have in those examples some um, examples where indigenous organizations, farmers organizations, and perhaps just anti-mining, you know, uh, organizations like Greens organizations, have managed to ally together for collective impact? Yes, I mean, I would say that's the tendency right now. Yeah. That's what we're moving towards in, in more and more countries. Also here, here in Mexico also, we have non-indigenous and indigenous uh, farmers movements banding together against these external threats. Some, some of them are, are mega development projects here in Mexico that are destroying the territory of everybody and so it's a sometimes having an, an overwhelming common external enemy can be a good tonic and help you relativize some of your little local disputes <laughs> absolutely don't disagree with that um i think there there are a few questions that have been coming up in the chat some are quite specific um and i wonder if we might even come back to them because i'd like to hear a little bit more about on the obstacles before we come back to some very yeah, specific examples. Um, in terms of, I think a relevant one in, in your list of obstacles is persistent bias. And I wonder if you could just talk us through your thoughts on persistent bias that's that's hindering agroecological movements. No, I mean, if, if we think about all of the institutions that affect uh, either, either rural farming or, or rural ranching, um, if we look first, if we look at the public sector without even looking at the private sector, we can look at um, agricultural universities and how mostly what they teach is the conventional monoculture input dependent uh, financial capital dependent model of farming. That's what they're training agronomists or animal scientists or uh, animal husband or husbandists or whatever they're called. They're all being trained with the dominant model, with a dominant mindset. Then when people go to banks to get credit, uh, generally they have to propose a, a, some kind of a business plan or farm plan, which is only going to be approved for credit for, for farm loans if it, if it matches the technological expectation of the, of the technical staff of the bank. And so, for example, we have farmers in Via Campesina in the United States who farm 3,000 acres of wheat 
So I'm thinking of one case of one one family, which is which is two brothers um, that they make so that they, they they have a a turnover of more than three million dollars a year in their gross income, but the two of them split thirty thousand dollars in net income, which put them both way below the official poverty line in the United States. So they're they're skating in a tiny tiny wafer thin profit margin, and they say they would love to get out of this, this high-tech wheat monoculture, but they can't because they owe so much money to the bank that they can't break out of it because the bank won't extend their credit unless they stick to, the, to, stick to that model. So the whole financial aspect of, of farming is, is, a, is a very important uh, aspect in terms of, in terms of that lock-in. To the, to the conventional model. Then if you look at all of the advertising for, for farm products, whether, whether it's for killing ticks on livestock or pests on, on crops or herbicide or fertilizer, there's overwhelming messages and increasingly chemical companies use other farmers and scientists as their spokespeople in their, in their commercial propaganda. So there's a whole brainwashing thing there's the whole dominant institution speak about feeding the world, making agriculture, modern agribusiness. So it, it's really, really, really deeply set and, 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 and even at a very unconscious level that people can't conceive of other ways to do it. And then if we look at the private sector, for example, in the United States, as an example, the average farmer receives 80 visits per year from chemical salesmen and for every and one visit per year from a government extension agent who's basically also going to tell you to buy the product that the 80 pesticide salesmen are telling you to buy yeah. or saleswomen as the case may be and and nobody's coming to them and talking about agroecology so yeah. it's like everything absolutely everything is pushing one way it's really swimming against the stream even though we have a better model we have better technology we have a better social system we have a better everything but the whole system is stacked the other way yeah well that I mean that leads neatly to the one of Martin's questions in the chat about the industrial scale compost tea spreading in the US and Mexico. And he's asking, would you welcome this technology in the context of climate change? And that's a like these are important questions, right? Is the iterative better something to um temporarily welcome while we move towards the full I, 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 I didn't I guess not? I didn't really understand what it is. Industrial what? Industrial scale compost tea. Uh, compost tea. Well, all of the industrial scale compost stuff is, in my opinion, is maintaining most of the aspects of the conventional dominant model, except the particular technology that's being produced at an industrial scale. So maybe it's 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 lowering some of the environmental impacts, but it's not changing the structure of power, the structure of finance, the structure of who gets the profit, the structure structure of squeezing farmers for high input costs. It's not it's not ad addressing any of those structural or economic issues. It's only taking a very narrow focus on a single technology and saying, OK, this is a little bit less damaging, but the rest of the system still sucks. So I'm not very excited about that. <laughs> so would you argue that those sorts of inputs are a bit of a distraction from the real project. I see somebody also narrowing the soil ecosystem. I mean when when you get when you get to these large scale things, they're going to be reproducing a very undiverse even biological alternative. And so I personally believe that people will be much better off using local resources, not spending exorbitant sums of money to bring off farm inputs. And the agro agroecological principles are, ve are very, very, very flexible and a lot of creativity can be used to, to figure out how, it, uh, for example, on a large scale composting may not be the, the solution at all. It may be green manures, it may be other kinds of things that lend themselves to a large scale, but, but that don't, but don't rely on that kind of a industrial technology. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. And that's one of those principles, right, about diversity across the system. Um, and and sites, sites. Just to give you an example, I heard I heard from from our Via Campesina members in Africa that that Bayer Monsanto has been buying all of the commercial composting compost companies across Africa. So they clearly see that as a good technology that they could get a, get their hands on for squeezing more money out of farmers. 
that's very bad news, isn't it? I mean, it's either them or Bill and Melinda Gates. Um, um, another, one, in them. another one of those, the obstacles you talk about is um, infrastructure problems, right? And we know with the centralized control of, you know, abattoirs and butcher shops and grain mills and dairy processing, and these things have been um, increasingly centralized. We actually just here in Victoria, we, we have two of our local abattoirs have just been taken over by, they were both, one was owned by family business, one that is now taken over by a Chinese company. One was owned by a large Singaporean company is now being taken over by JBS. Um, our, our options are getting more and more limited as we've been advocating for more options. So you're following the US model where a few companies bought all of the abattoirs in the whole country and shut them down. And yeah. then, uh, and, 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 and because of, of, of health, so supposed health regulations, which really exist to support the lar uh, large companies, it's illegal to use anything other than a certified abattoir. And so the only owners of cert certified abattoirs in the United States are JBS and a few uh, international beef, a few other companies. And so, and they won't buy from small farmers unless you produce under contract to them. And you can't have a contract for them unless you have a ridiculously large scale, ridiculously unhealthy concentration of animals, whether we're talking about pigs or cows or chickens or whatever, and, and become breeding grounds for new viruses and pandemics and, and antibiotic resistant bacteria and water pollution. So we often talk about in, in the U.S., context, for example, if one pig farm has 400,000 pigs, that's, that's, that's 20,000 small farmers who could, who could be having uh, 20 pigs, or two, I forgot the exact math, but in fact, there were many more family farmers in the U.S. are cut out of the animal production business because of monopoly control over abattoirs than would be needed to produce just as much meat. And so there's no reason why you have to have that kind of confined animal production. And I think with the COVID-19 pandemic and most of the explanations of the, of the possible or probable causes of the, of, of, of the emergence of the, of the new coronavirus being linked in one way or another to that kind of, act of, of animal production, animal complex, animal, animal protein complex production, and even the laboratory escape hypothesis because who funds the research on gain of function work on viruses, even in Wuhan, is the, the EcoHealth Alliance, which is in large part funded either by the Pentagon or by the large agribusiness companies. And so one way or another, agribusiness is responsible for it and the previous pandemics that we've had before. So that, that, that monopoly control, as you say, grain elevators, it's exactly the same. And so you're having happen now in Australia what already happened in the United States. And, and believe me, it ain't pretty. You got to fight against it. Yeah, and I'm aware I'm, I'm across what the Niche Meat Processes Assistance Network has been doing in America, the NMPAN, and actually got some support from them when I went and looked at advertising in the, in the US. Um, and here we're 10 years behind on the small scale abattoir movement, but it is happening. And we've hosted abattoir roundtables and been working with ministers and um, trying to trying to pave a way for us to rebuild localized abattoirs. But, but we're very say, really infrastructure is critical, and that's a, a very important battlefield that can't. Uh, the, the thing is that, that the attacks are happening on so many sides. One, uh, a move, you have to have a movement because only a movement is big enough to be fighting all of those different fronts at the same time. Yeah, actually, I'm going to come back to the movement thing. I've got obviously some fairly strong views as well, and I'd love to get you to throw yours out in, a, in as inflammatory a way as you possibly can. Um, but I will just quickly answer. Scott's asked um, if JBS dominate the abattoir industry, wouldn't that be deemed anti-competitive? It's with the ACCC, which is our um, anti-competitive watchdog. So it's with them right now, Scott, and AFSA will be um, putting out a template for people to write the, their own submissions to the ACCC on why we would say that it's anti-competitive, how it's going to impact on us, the risks that it places us in with 30% of the pig slaughter in this country would be in JBS's control. Um, and, yeah. and that didn't happen, obviously. I mean, if, if almost every country in the world has anti, has anti-monopoly legislation on the books, that sounds really good, except that it's never applied. Okay. And so, I mean, that would, that, that, that's one, one of the demands of the, 
the global peasant family farmer movement is how about just applying the laws that already exist as a starting point? Right. And that would be a perfect case. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? <laughs> So, um, yeah, we don't really expect it. We, we expect it to go through the ACCC, but um, uh, we're going to put in submissions to at least slow it down, we hope. And, and get th that should give us time to build more abattoirs in the meanwhile. Um, Anya has asked, is there a risk from Peter's view that regenerative agriculture, due to its lack of social political principles, could co-opt the agroecology or food sovereignty movements due to attention from international organizations and corporations? I mean, I yeah, know quickly uh, yeah. crop life have an agroecology tab on their website, right? So that's right. an example. But yeah, go on. Yeah, please. I mean, I think I think that the co corporations are trying to co-op both regenerative agriculture and agroecology, and they've uh, and as you say, crop life has the agroecology tab on their website. But there seems to be more more corporate concentration around regenerative agriculture, and there, there's a whole there's a a who's who of the major food sector corporations that have jumped onto the regenerative agriculture bandwagon. As you say, the technical side is pretty much the same. So we're talking about a, a more narrow definition. So it has the regenerative aspects of the soil and the ecosystem, but not the political and social aspects. And so it seems like that's okay for agribusiness as long as they don't, as long as we don't touch the social, political and economic aspects. And I'm sure there are a lot of people in the regenerative agriculture movement who do have the same social and political principles, but the way it's playing out, I, I would say on, on, the, on the large game board is that uh, regenerative agriculture seems to be being captured by the corporate sector as the depoliticized version of agroecology and the way for them to address sustainability issues without addressing social justice issues. So yeah, I'm concerned about that. Yeah, I agree. Cooptation is always a risk and already happening. But um, I think as we wrote, um, Amita shared earlier a piece that I wrote recently on agroecology and regenerative agriculture and the, the lack of that political framework that puts regen ag more at risk because agroecology has, has like decades of research and explicit political framing. So it is harder to co-opt something that people already understand and have defined. Right. And I think there's a general strategy out there to neutralize agroecology by inventing lots of additional concepts like a smoke screen. So we have climate smart agriculture, sustainable intensification, regenerative agriculture, sustainable agriculture. And by, by creating all of these different names, I think the goal is to create confusion. And so that's why personally, I prefer to stick with agroecology. And I know that's pretty much the Via Campesina position as well, although Via Campesina says, we shouldn't fight about the name, we should fight about the principles. So I guess in that, from that point of view, okay, we could call it regenerative, but we'd have to fight for the same social, political, economic principles that we're including in agroecology then. Yep, yep. Um, now, Lou has asked if we could talk about Big Ag's co-option of the food system, UN Food System Summit, but we might come back to that in a second. I'll put it on my list because I do just want to, I mean, that's just, we could, I think actually Amita, while we're talking, can you pull up the IPC CSM Agroecology Action Research Group? And um, there's one more I'm forgetting, uh, uh, Livia Campesina's statements about the UN Food System Summit because there, there are heaps of clear statements about what's wrong with the co-option of the Food System Summit. But I wanted to go to some of the more um, oh, well, actually, quickly, a thing on conventional versus agroecological approaches to pedagogy. So as we're trying to grow these movements, obviously, um, there are heaps of, of regen ag courses being offered good ones to really like holistic thinking and all of that. Um, but then not necessarily touching on that political side and also the model. There's a, there's a very key difference in the model of how we teach and learn agroecology. Can you go into that a bit? You know, well, well, I think that that agri that agroecology has taken the stance that that uh, that farmers' knowledge is the is the most important thing, and uh, and that the the conventional knowledge industry through ag universities and research centers and private sector research is trying to 
de-skill farmers by, by, by taking the knowledge out of farmers' hands and putting it into the hands of technicians, corporate representatives, salespeople, technical experts, and create a whole, a whole world of dependencies, all of which also not only, not only immobilize farmers because they're dependent on these external experts, it also makes them dependent on what those experts recommend. And if those experts are be beholden to the input selling companies, then they're going to they're gonna tell people whatever your problem is, the solution is buying another, another input, which is typically what they do. So therefore, in the educational process, we push for, for, for turning it around. Instead of training agronomists at agriculture universities to be know-it-all know bringers of knowledge to the ignorant masses in, in rural areas, they should be trained to understand that the most important knowledge is, is the local detailed knowledge that farmers have of their own reality, their own ecosystem, their own farm, their own soil, their own surrounding forest, their own, their own animals, and, and that they should be trained to facilitate farmers processes by which farmers exchange knowledge and learn from each other rather than imposing knowledge from outside that 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 disempowers farmers control over their own productive systems through the, through their own knowledge so it's really a very different way of organizing the whole educational process if we're going to take a look at it from the more agroecological point of view yeah Absolutely, that farmer to farmer knowledge sharing and trusting oneself and one's knowledge of the country that you farm. Um, and that's where I think we have opportunities to learn a lot more from the original owners of this country and who, who talk a lot about listening to country and um, spending your time on country and listening to it, what it's telling you, I think is, is really the way forward for our movement and a major distinction between thinking we can bring experts who are not even from this soil to teach us how to manage it, you know. It's, uh, if you think about external exports and who are who are really beholden to a system based on large companies who are trying to sell the same product everywhere, they're going to always be pushing one size fits all solutions because that, that's the only way that the system can make a profit out of this. And if you just think about about clothing, one size fits all really doesn't fit as well as the specific size. That you that you need, and it's going to be the same with with agri with with different ways of farming. There is, there are no one size fits all solutions, except highly toxic poisons that you spray everywhere to kill everything. But that's that that's far from being the best way to go about things. Yeah, absolutely. On our farm, there are um, four of us who work together at all times on the farm, and then usually one or two interns are living with us as well. And our Monday morning meeting, one of our top agenda items is what, what's the land telling us? What are the paddock's priorities? And before we set our own priorities, we ask for the land's priorities. And that really helps guide us in making better decisions. Um, now, again, looking forward, achieving scale. I mean, we talk about scaling up and scaling out. I don't think we need to go into the, the distinction so much, but the... Um, you talk a lot about social organization, horizontal processes, you know, you've already been speaking about all of these peasant protagonism, um, farming practices that work, motivating discourses, there's a, the list goes on in that wonderful volumes uh, from you and Miguel. Um, would you like to talk more about what you see in a country like this, again, talking global north um, and talking Australia specifically, what, which of those areas would you say we need to be focusing on like to achieve our agroecological transition here in this country? You know, what, what I, I think in, in anywhere, the, 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 the farmer to farmer, or as we call it in Spanish, campesino to campesino, philosophy is, is, is the best way to go about it because uh, we're going to be exchanging knowledge with each other that, that already works in the, in the biome, in the region, in the ecological and social and economic reality in which we live and we're empowering ourselves and we're creating, making knowledge into a, into a collective construct where uh, where many minds are stronger, are, are, are more powerful than one as opposed to individualizing knowledge. And so uh, in, if we talk about the global south with where most farmers may be the direct descendants of indigenous people who've lived there for thousands of years, then a farmer to farmer process can be largely or typically mostly based on recovering traditional or ancestral knowledge of how to farm in those places before pesticides were available or commercial seeds. In, 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 the, in the more settler uh, colonial kinds of countries, maybe there's been a break with that kind of knowledge, 
maybe maybe that can happen through horizontal exchange with indigenous people or maybe you know if settler farmers have been in an area for many generations they're going to already have a lot of knowledge gained about how to farm in those realities they're going to have tried out a lot of different practices they're going to have invented a lot of solutions themselves and there's still going to be tremendous amount of raw material for these horizontal farmer to farmer exchanging and learning and collective knowledge building processes so i would say really in in almost any situation for example and in, in california they have the sunday farmer brunch program from the small farm center of the university of california where they where where they they they, they are identifying farmers who have good ecological type solutions to common problems and then those farmers are hosting a sunday brunch where other farmers from the region with a similar problem come and share with them and, and walk around their farm and have coffee together and it's really exactly the same thing as campesino campesino in cuba brazil mozambique mexico it's just in a you know in a different kind of cultural reality but it's the same basic principle same as agroecology in general we're talking about applying the same principles in different ways based on different realities. That's great. I, I can't get away from the um, the irony of it being a Sunday brunch as a very global north kind of thing to be doing rather than a campesino a campesino. But well, I don't know any farmers who brunch. Same principle. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but still, that's really good. Um, I agree. And I think obviously social organization is, is key to this because on the one hand, local communities getting together and doing some good work together is one thing, but when we need real systemic change, you know, organizations like, like the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance are critical to um, continuing to cohere these movements into actual okay. movements. I see that somebody put in the chat, how do these, how do the more technical principles blend with the social and, and political ones? So, you know, perhaps we could, we could resolve some of these technical issues through these horizontal farmer to farmer exchanges. Not perhaps, we can. But if we don't get into the political struggle side of things, we're not going to be able to resolve all of those other barriers that we already talked about, like how the, the banking system is locking people in, how the educational system is locking people in, how corporate money and politics is locking people in. All of those other things um, cannot be addressed with just a more regenerative way of farming. They can only be addressed through political struggle. And that means having a uh, a, a social movement that goes beyond just the technical aspects of farming. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, without the social movement we have here, we wouldn't have got the meeting we had yesterday with JBS. We wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have the ear of the ministers in many states because we are an organization that represents many, many people. The, the origins of JBS as a Brazilian company that was key to uh, the fall of the of the of the Lula government in Brazil and the rise of right wing fascism and as soon as things got too hot in brazil they changed their they switched their corporate uh, registration to the united states and from one day to the next went from being a brazilian company to a, an american company or to elude brazilian justice they're yeah. a, very, a very criminal corporation they're a very criminal corporation they were at pains to tell us they're not the bad guys and i was i was um to see who the bad guys like poker face <laughs> <laughs> um yeah um, the, I want to, before we finish up, we've got actually another question there from Emma Kate, uh, can AFSA envision a campaign to promote first, first nations land back movement in this country? For sure. I can envision that it's going, like, there's a lot of work that has to happen before we can successfully do something like that. But I think that's a, a wonderful question and idea, um, of how to, uh, do real work to support indigenous sovereignty on on their own lands. So, as the indigenous peoples movement on the global scale is 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 one of the one of the fastest mo becoming most visible kind of movements that we have in many countries in the world, it, it makes a lot of people rethink a lot of things. And so, in the U.S., the National Family Farm Coalition, which has historically been either settler farmers or African American farmers has realized because of the new visibility of indigenous people's movement that there's a lot of things that have to be talked about yeah. and those things can e e either can just say okay we don't want to talk about it we don't want to deal with it or can say okay let's try and and let's try and talk to each other and say 
maybe we don't need all of the land that we have, but, but we have been here for several generations. So maybe we need some of the land. Maybe we can talk about the different kind of problems that, that all of us have. And if we can come up with new ways of, of doing things here in Chiapas, Mexico, we have this very creative Zapatista indigenous people's movement and their world famous spokesperson who used to be Subcomandante Marcos, what is now Subcomandante Galeano, uh, has a metaphor of the dog cat or, or gato pero in, in Spanish. And he uses it to say this, that, that, that the system always presents us with false choices, that it's a, with false dichotomies. You either have to choose all of the land for white settlers or, or kill all the white settlers and give all the land to indigenous people. But what he says is that the metaphor of the, of the dog cat is it's neither a dog nor a cat, it's something completely different. And we have to break out of the false dichotomies or the false choices that the system gives us. And I guess a crude way of, say, of, of saying that is thinking outside the box. But, but, but we can't, but, but, but the, the basic message is we can't accept those kinds of dichotomies. We have to, to think about ways to completely get outside of the conventional way of posing these problems. Absolutely, I'm a leading indigenous thinker here uh, Bruce Pascoe said years ago and still says, you know, black people aren't going anywhere, white people aren't going anywhere. So what are we going to do about it? Exactly. And that's something is, uh, that AFSA has put into, we have a first people's first strategy that right. we've just started developing strongly. And I think Amita's going to share the link here in a minute, but it is that getting out of the dichotomous, exactly. somebody has so to- So spokesperson here after he says it's not one, it's not the other, it's something completely different. Then he says, bow meow instead of bow wow <laughs> for the, <laughs> the dog cat. <laughs> That's good. Um, now we're just about out of time and I want to I want to actually just make sure people know that AFSA is about to run the Agroecology Roadshow heading up to uh, all the way to far north Queensland. So Stuart and I from here at Joan I will be driving um, border restrictions, you know, willing. Uh, we'll be heading off in about 10 days to do a whole month. There are three workshops already scheduled with um, uh, at Echo Valley Farm, Belvedere Farm, and Belisato Farms in Queensland. And those are agroecology workshops that are nearly fully subscribed. So I would not waste time if you're in those areas. Um, we're also doing what I've been calling peasants in the pub in my head and with my comrades, but I might need to for Queensland rename that. Um, and call it something else, but the idea is more informal catch-ups on the way up with farmers who just, or farmers and allies who wanna come and chat about the revolution and how to be part of it and make it actually happen. Um, so we'll be publishing more details of where we'll be on that, that trip. And the idea is that very much- great. I'm very glad to hear that you're doing that and it's very much in the farmer to farmer spirit. It is, yeah, it's really exciting, Peter. I'm, I have to say, I'm feeling, yeah, Jared, Jared's here. We're, he's the first one we're visiting actually on the on the very first day out of here. Um, and we'll be, yeah, I think we'll be seeing Nguru Farm at Gundaroo and we'll be in Orange and Armadale and then Southern Queensland and then heading all the way to the Daintree. So if people have ideas of where we should go on the way, preferably not thousands of kilometers out of the way, it's a big country, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's already going to be a big trip and an exciting one to keep grow this, growing this movement. Does anyone have any other questions for Peter before we let him get some sleep there down in Mexico? Or have you used, oh, there was actually one that was quite specific from Antoine that I thought, Peter, I don't know whether either of us know about this particular initiative from the FAO. I gotta go way back in the chat. Um, oh, somebody was, was asking about the UN Food System Summit. Maybe I could address that very quickly. Uh, sure. And, and, and that, that, that's a, you know, uh, Via Campesina and, and other uh, international social movements, as well as nonprofits, environmental movements, and others have for a long time been uh, pressuring FAO through the International Planning Committee on Food Sovereignty and have managed to get FAO to move a little bit, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, a little bit on, on agroecology and food sovereignty issues, not as much as we'd like. But now in this UN Food Systems Summit, it's really like a huge step backwards because they really were not open to having significant civil society participation. And so Via Campesina together with almost all other social 
net social movements as well as even scientists networks have decided to boycott the UN Food Systems Summit because it's really only the corporate and government voices that are going to be heard. And so instead of that, there are gonna be parallel uh, civil society forums to debate a lot of these issues, but out of protest about the way this summit is, is, is going. And very unfortunately, the, the new director general of FAO from China has been a great di disappointment for civil society and turns out to really be re representing chem China and other corporate interests in China. And so it has not been a step forward for, 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 for FAO, even though Via Campesina supported his candidacy against a super neoliberal European candidate, but it's turned out to be two bad choices as the, as the dog cat would have warned us. Yeah, yeah, it has been. And, and we did post quite a lot of links of what's been written about the problems of the Food System Summit. And that's right, Via Campesina, the Civil Society Mechanism, the International Planning for, Committee for Food Sovereignty, uh, and, and a number of consortia of, of um, academics have boycotted the Food System Summit and we are organizing a people summit that should happen. Well, actually multiple groups are organizing multiple people summits as we should. Um, so there will be people summits coming up over the coming years, I think, in re not in reaction to, as a continuation of the food sovereignty movement strength in the last 30 years, really. Um, and I think that brings us to a close. And um, I just want to, Thank you so much, um, Peter, for joining us. It's been a real thrill to have you here to help egg on our revolution here and, and contextualize this, contextualize it with what's been going on all around the world. Um, your knowledge is really welcome and thank you. Well, thank you. It's been very enjoyable and I'm glad to see uh, Australia as part of our Via Campesina movement. And I guess I'll just close by repeating the Via Campesina slogan, which is globalize the struggle and globalize hope. Thank you very Eva. much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everyone, for coming.